potential or a pipeline uh, crisscrossing every corner of the delta. In the absence of electricity, you know, the gas flare became light for us and we, as kids, we were, we were happy. But unknowing to us, it was actually uh, slowly killing us, you know. So. But nobody was there to even educate us on the dangers of what uh, uh, was uh, burning uh, around those environments. I am Comrade Sonny Ofehe, uh, an environmental and human rights activist uh, living in the Netherlands. I came into the Netherlands in 1995 uh, as a political refugee and uh, from here I've been working to uh, show the uh, oil extraction uh, processes in the Niger Delta, in, in particularly focusing on uh, the impact, the environmental impact, impact of this extraction on the lives of the people of the Niger Delta. I mean, it is, I come from the area, I am from Delta State. Uh, I've been a victim of the environmental problems in the region. And I think, you know, having this platform to be here, particularly in the Netherlands, where it is the home of uh, Shell, the biggest uh, oil, multinational oil company in Nigeria, I think the people need to be aware of uh, what is happening in the Niger Delta. So I basically um, do short documentaries. Uh, I visit some of these areas, some of these locations, and I do short documentaries to raise awareness uh, to the situation back in the Niger Delta. I have al always used video uh, filming and short documentary uh, uh, as a tool for my course. So right now I am starting uh, the African Europe Insights uh, with the Sony Affair show and in this first uh, episode we want to focus on uh, the illegal oil bunker uh, situation in the Niger Delta and how it has um, devastated the environment so we want to look at um, the role of the ordinary people who are practicing it uh, and also the role of the government uh, the, the, the security forces in trying to combat this situation and what they've done if they're actually using the right processes in, in trying to eliminate the illegal oil bunker. And also talk about uh, those who benefit from this uh, um, illegal oil bunker situation and, uh, and uh, most especially the environmental impact as it affects the people of the area. Our destination is where uh, the local people are doing these uh, organizing this illegal oil refinery thing and uh, these people have chosen this, uh, this profession because, uh, because of poverty, because of neglect, because of frustration. So they want to take us there and show us uh, the process, how they begin and how they end, what they get and how they transport it. So but due to security issues, concerns, because uh, Around the creek right now, it's very dangerous. The, 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 the military forces are fighting against the militant group, so the waterways are very dangerous. So we have chosen this spot, which is very quiet, and we hope to beat all the security network and get to our destination. They have the illegal oil refinery and uh, they're going to take us around the, the spots and we, they're going to be introducing us to every stage of the, of the process. Uh, the illegal oil refinery uh, is a thing that started like three, four years ago in Nigeria, but today we have uh, more than a thousand, more than two thousand to be precise, more than two thousand illegal refineries scattered all over the Niger Delta. And this has created environmental consequences. Uh, and the irony is that the, the illegal oil refinery is being carried out by the locals themselves. And when you talk about illegal oil refineries, you talk about the, uh, a lot of processes leads up to the illegal oil refinery. You talk about uh, vandalization of uh, pipelines through which they get uh, uh, 
uh, illegal uh, crude oil. You talk about the oil bunkery processes where uh, this illegal oil refine or this illegal crude oil are being uh, taken from and then brought to a location where they are locally being processed without the normal environmental precautions taking place. So the bitumen, the end process of the crude oil has spilled all over the ground and I've been to those sites. I've seen uh, the processes itself and I know that some of those sites will never ever get vegetation anymore. I know for security reasons mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to mention names, we're not going to talk about where this place is located, mm -hmm. uh, but can you just briefly explain to us what is happening in this place? Yeah, this is a, a village in the creek in Niger Delta, Nigeria. This is a place we refine our, we refine our locally refined diesel. Like yeah, we call this place a camp. Yeah. And from there we source for crude, you know, so to speak, illegally because of the problem on the, on the waterways. They supply all the crude. Who we, supply you? The, how do you get the crude? I will buy. We buy from the wooden people. The people that they come to us. Okay, the people come to you here. Yes, yes. And then you buy here. We buy here. Okay. This is the oil. Okay. This one. Yeah, this is the raw material for refining. Mm -hmm. It is called crude. Yeah. Bunny light. As it got to its own point, point. then the product will start, you know, you know, drilling down from the product. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, these pipes, the is for the waste. Yes, because as we are refining, mm. the one that burns to the level of uh, diesel, mm. will go straight to the other point which I will show you. The 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 waste will not flow into the chambers. Okay, that is where you have all the things with black oil. Okay, um, but people are complaining all the time of uh, spillage. Uh, they say the oil multinational company, they spill. They have to clean up. But this is also. Another sp another spillage. Uh, I mean, killing your own environment with this sort of process. What do, do you consider? Do you put into consideration environmental pro problems that you may cause with this? Yeah. Like ov obviously now, no plants can grow here anymore. Yes. Do you consider that, or you just? Wow. This is dangerous. Stop! Stop! Yeah, this is really dangerous. So it can explode like this, right? Eh? Yeah, sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. You see? Okay, so this is why you do, water, this is why you cool it with water. water yeah, it's a kind of, it's, it's, it's a kind of radiator. Yeah. Just to cool in the heat. Okay. Now the diesel that they take now. Then there will be the motion in the center of the diesel. No, no. That white plate. Okay, this is diesel now. This is diesel, yeah. It's very hot. Okay, it's hot. Okay, that's cool. Mm. Wow. So, so the same thing as the one refined from refinery. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe this. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Okay, like how long this process it take? The whole process. Uh, I did not. Did not want to go Three, four hours. Three. Yeah. You know, you try to look at the situation and you look at the people who are working there, you look at their life. Uh, instead of going to school, they are actually uh, on those places working and earning what I call peanuts. Uh, this is uh, the young man who, do, who does the processing uh, by the plant here. He has tremendous experience at his age. Um, he's supposed to be in school right now and uh, he's doing this process so I just want to ask him a couple of questions from uh, his experience here. So if you tell us uh, how, your role for this place, now when I get the place I'll be, you they work for, you they work for somebody, speak loud. I they work for somebody, mm. will they pay me for a week. Okay. Yes. You they go to school? Yeah. Uh, you they go to school? I they go to school. So when we do all the day, yeah. we we'll come here, come work. Okay. So we we'll pay me, so that I go see money to pay school fees. Okay, so you they you they do this work now so that you fit get money when you take pay school fees. Yes, yes. Okay, so which means now you they support yourself. Yes. Okay, your school for you they live around here or you they come from yeah. somewhere? And they come from somewhere. Okay. okay. Can you tell how much he earns? Like so how much did they did they pay you a week? 
They pay me fifty thousand. Fifteen thousand. Yes. In a week. Yes. Okay. So that every week you get them like that. Be just one week, then you go. Every week I get them. So I continue until we resume. Okay. Okay. But then you look at the quantity of crude they bring in the process and the end diesel, kerosene and, and fuel that they get, then you see a multi-billion industry and uh, the oil companies have said they're losing more than 100,000 ba 100, barrels of crude oil you know, per day to illegal oil bunkery. And then you look at the, the amount that they're losing, which is running into billions of dollars uh, in a year. So this is a menace that I think has to be caught. But then the government is also finding a solution to, to uh, stopping it. And the solution they actually applied through the JTF, which is the Joint Task Force, the military wing of the Nigerian Security Forces, is actually uh, a crude, process, a crude uh, system where they just come to those sites and uh, set them uh, ablaze and uh, creating more environmental uh, damage to the environment instead of radiating the environment. And, uh, in this uh, episode two, you see the uh, the Joint Task Force, in this case the Navy, uh, coming to one of the sites they've been able to identify, and you see uh, the way they handled the the destruction of those sites. And then sometimes some of these people who work there are caught up in this uh, in this explosion and some die, some escape in this uh, in this film, you see some struggling to escape from those locations by swimming out of those places, and some of them uh, may not be accounted for. So we, we, we want to look at the process itself, what has motivated these people to do this, and how they carry them out, and how the government is trying to tackle it and see if it's the right process. <laughs> Oh, God, it's Honestly, if you leave it to me to stop this illegal refineries or illegal bunkery, it will have to involve the entire members of the community around this area, the traditional rulers, and especially if I may advise, honestly, as a Nigerian, I would throw it probably right to the two respected House of Assemblies. There is oil spillage. So far it is deliberate, committed by somebody within that community. Uh, the leadership of that community uh, should not be left on the throne. And at the same time, 
members of the community of that particular community where there is spillage or uh, where illegal bunkering occurs should not be compensated and with that uh, they will be able to uh, either stop or reduce uh, such criminalities. Uh, oil theft will be eradicated gradually. Uh, you can see some few weeks back we destroyed over 100,000 metric tons and uh, today uh, as you have seen we have destroyed just about five illegal oil refineries with over 30 drums of uh, crude oil. Uh, the number has dropped down seriously and I will continue to do that. And I also spoke to uh, Laji Mojahid Asare Dokubo who was the first uh, known militant from the Niger Delta, you know, who ran this uh, Niger Delta People's Volunteer Force. And he's of the opinion that uh, uh, in the last three years, the illegal oil refineries' uh, consequence on the environment in terms of damage, uh, it's more uh, than what the oil companies have done in the last 50 years. Through so-called local refineries and what they call bullfire, it is wicked, it is evil, it is totally, totally satanic. What do you think, what step should be taken now to, to, to stop this? We must do everything because our environment is dying. When you go home, when you go to the... Look, I went to one Orobo village. The whole community is covered in smoke. Black thick smoke. The whole community. As I'm going, one black smoke is going up there. Another one is going up there. Another one is going up there. The recklessness is something beyond the imagination. So when we point our fingers at the multinational, we should also, also point our fingers at ourselves, that we are destroying our own environment because of our insatiable hodge for the things of pleasure. Not even we are using it usefully, you say they are using it usefully. No, for pleasure for women, for watches, and most of them end up, most of these people end up very sadly. At the time they are going to live, they will become poorer. They will become poorer, extremely poor. They become poorer. And that is what we must stop. As people of Niger Delta, we must stop this. We must fight these characters. We must tell them that is not the reason for our struggle. The reason for our struggle is not to take the guns and go and threaten our old mothers and fathers in the village, our secondary school brothers and sisters in the village. No. It is to bring betterment for our people. If we can't do that, then we can go to anywhere to go and look for jobs. Both fire is not a job. It's not because of unemployment. It's because of greed. And that's why I have little or no respect for the people they call militants. Because they are the drivers of this environmental genocide against our people. With their guns, they silence the voices of dissent in our society, in our communities so that people will not talk. So the young man can no longer fish. The robo man can no longer go to his farm. The isoko man can no longer go to his farm. The shakri man can no longer fish. The larger man can no longer fish because of the greed of a few people. Because they go after the residue of their illegal uh, a crude way of refining, they pour it into the sea, pour it in the farmland, and it's asphalt. That's right. It goes, cover the bed of the sea, kill all life, all life.
can that not be blamed on unemployment, government negligence? It's not unemployment and because and these people are not looking for 65,000. Let us not blame it. It's so simplistic. They're not looking for 65,000. They're looking for billions. That they use for nothing. You see them, they go and buy Jaguar. Later Jaguar. They go and buy latest Mercedes Benz, wristwatch, telephone, 25,000 euro telephone. They drink uh, a bottle of drink that costs 1 million naira. They sleep in the best hotel. They are not even. So it has nothing to do with poverty. Now, coming to environmental degradation, we like to lie about our environment, which is wrong. Share, Chevron. To the final help, Exxon Mobil and other oil prospecting companies have indeed degraded our environment for over 50 years. But what we have done in the last five years with our own hand is worse than what they did in 50 years. That with our own hands, we are destroying our environment. But we should not also forget that these are youths who are actually jobless. Uh, some of them that I met were actually graduates. They didn't have jobs. So they, yeah, they just sat down and they became uh, vulnerable to any kind of approach. You know, for as long as they make some money out of it, for them it's fine. But how the crude oil comes and uh, where they take it to to sell, it, the, the people on the ground do not actually know. So having had this experience of uh, filming over the years, having so much content in my archives, I decided that it was time for me to start uh, uh, my own show. And, uh, and this show is going to be shown on uh, Ben Television and it's going to be called the African Europe Insight. It is good to also know that uh, this show will not only focus on my course, it's going to be, it's going to also focus on the general uh, life in, in Europe as it affects uh, Nigerians and Africans and also look at Africa with, uh, with emphasis on Nigeria and see what positive uh, things we can take out of uh, Nigeria that I think people in Europe will have to see. So um, we'll be talking about, we, we'll be looking at uh, human life, we'll be looking at culture, we'll be looking at uh, uh, you know, bringing people who have actually, you know, gone through a lot as uh, diaspora people living in Europe and they've been able to, you know, overcome the, the, the odds and to become uh, people that, uh, yeah, those around them are very proud of. So we want to look at their lives and use their life to encourage other people. We want to also look at the business climate in Europe why it's going well and also look at the business climate in Nigeria and find a way to, uh, to carry out information that can benefit uh, both continents. So uh, we also will be looking at uh, a whole lot of areas uh, and also talk about inspiration, um, uh, the area of religion also and the differences in culture and how uh, this culture affects uh, people who have come here as immigrants. I'm going to speak to you today as a living testimony of what God can do for you if you refuse to be defeated by the odds that stand before you. And I'm going to tell you that God has deposited something within us. So it's not as if your situation is greater than God. It is just because you have refused to activate that part in you yes. that God has given to you. Yes. The Bible tells me that. A lot of Nigerians live in diaspora. I mean, when you talk about Europe, you talk about within the European Union, you talk about 27 uh, countries where a lot of Nigerians live. And they all have access to uh, watching Ben television via satellite. Uh, it will be very interesting for them uh, to follow uh, through my show uh, what is happening back home in Nigeria. And also, uh, Ben Television is also showing in, in, in Nigeria. So it will also be interesting for those back home 
who are living in Nigeria or who have the intention of wanting to travel to Europe either as immigrants or as visitors to also know about what is happening in Europe. And that is what we want to focus on. Jesus, you are condemned.